Good morning, Titans. Welcome to CSUF News. I'm Dylan Ferris. And I'm Alexis Garcia. After two years of concerts being on pause due to COVID-19, fans finally get to see their favorite artists again. Campus reporter Kristen Magnolak investigates the precautions venues are taking to keep everybody safe. Concerts are now making their way back into California after a year of show cancellations and reschedules. But to attend these events, all guests must verify clearance of COVID-19. There have been so many different um, mandates that we have been given throughout the past year and a half. And so we just abide by them and, and do our part in beating the pandemic. On September 20th, the California Department of Public Health issued a new statewide mandate that requires proof of vaccinations or negative COVID-19 test results from those attending gatherings of more than a thousand people. This mandate is expected to last until November 1st. Guests are eager to come back. We've had a next amount of shows and a lot of them have been sold out. To be granted entry, all guests must present either physical or electronic documentation that shows that they are vaccinated or have tested negative for COVID-19. I think that's pretty helpful because I felt safer going to that concert knowing that like people were either vaccinated or like they had tested negative within the last few days. But as COVID-19 and the Delta variant continue to dominate the news, guests still show some concern for their safety. It was going around that some people have been getting fake vaccination cards, so that would also be an issue. Aside from this mandate, concert venues encourage all guests to wear face coverings. Sanitation stations are also available to guests at all times. I just encourage everybody to always just stay in touch with their um, county health department and know what the mandates are in, in whichever uh, venue they're visiting. Concert venues will continue to implement these health guidelines to ensure that all guests have an enjoyable yet safe concert experience. Krista Magdunuk, CSUF News. Thank you, Kristen. It seems like everyone can now safely enjoy concerts again. Concerts aren't the only thing going back to normal. Unemployment programs set during the spike of COVID-19 have ended, causing recipients to return back to work. Let's take a look. For the past year, Sarah Alam has been receiving pandemic unemployment assistance. Now that unemployment benefits have ended on September 4th, Alam and many others are left figuring out their next step. My plans are to reach out to my previous employer and see if they'll need my help again. I'm also going to look on Indeed to see who is hiring in my area for any local jobs. A report from the Labor Department shows that the unemployment rate from last month has sunk from 5.2% to 4.8%. Although the rate has gone down, not everyone has started looking for work again. The lack of job participation has left employers desperate for workers. Employers, like the one behind me, have been hiring in hopes that the unemployed come back to work. Although workers, like Alam, still have concerns about re-entering the job market. I am worried about getting COVID because cases could spike up again. And I do not want to be laid off again if I get a job. On top of COVID-19 concerns, people are not re-entering the job market because they are searching for new careers. Aaron Pop, economic professor at Cal State Fullerton, shares his insights as to why the unemployed aren't rushing back to work. Doctors and nurses who are burnt out, maybe they want to do something different, or maybe people who are working retail there and, and um, in the fast food industry, right, or high contact industries, and they don't want to deal with the potential from for sickness from a pandemic or just don't want to be in the service industry anymore. They're going to need to retool their skills and enter a new position, perhaps go back to school. The end of the pandemic unemployment assistance program has changed the careers of many. As time goes on, we will see how the labor market continues to transition. Alexis Dela Cruz, CSUF News. Thank you, Alexis. Now for a different kind of law created during COVID. That's right, Dylan. New Texas state law banning abortion as early as six weeks into a pregnancy has sparked protests all over the country, including here in Orange County. More on the story, we have Emily Mulgar on the scene at the Women's March in Fullerton. Hundreds rallied in Fullerton on October 2nd in response to a new Texas law which bans nearly all abortions. Marchers assembled here on the lawn of the North Justice Center before heading down towards Harbor Boulevard holding signs like this one into downtown Fullerton. 
The Women's March was just one out of more than 650 demonstrations held across the country. Harry and Debbie Longenbacher organized the march focusing on the Women's Health Protection Act, which recently passed in the House and now waits in the Senate. Fortunately, both of our state senators are co-sponsors for that bill, but we wanted to march in solidarity with other states who are facing uh, you know, draconian laws, such as Texas, for instance. It's been really big in the news lately. Demonstrators chanted and held signs while dozens of cars honked and waved in support. Planned Parenthood of Orange and San Bernardino counties donated signs and banners for the protests. In an emailed statement, Senior VP of Communication and Donor Relations Nicole Ramirez explained why they got involved with the Women's March. We're already seeing the impact of those restrictions here in California, as Planned Parenthood health centers throughout our state are seeing on average two to three Texans per day for essential health care, including abortion. Ramirez also added, if we've learned anything in the past five years, it is that elections matter. Make sure you are registered to vote and pay attention to local elections to help ensure extreme laws, like those in Texas, don't make their way to California. A federal judge has again refused to block the ban, but has agreed to hear arguments on November 1st. In Fullerton, CSUF News, Emily Melgar. Thanks, Emily. We'll be looking forward to hearing those arguments. Stick around, Titans. We'll be right back with a local story on Disneyland's new Magic Key Pass and what you can do to get them. Anytime they're playing music downstairs, it's, it's loud. I go downstairs, see what they're doing, see what music they're doing, see what they're dancing to. I go play piano downstairs, they come get involved. Leah has a drum set beside it, banging that. Any music, uh, that's what they do. Welcome back, Titans. We now have reporter Timothy Foster joining us to tell us more about what Disneyland's new Magic Key Passes entail. Thank you, Alexis. Due to the pandemic, Disneyland has had to change a lot of the ways they operate, including tickets. The previous annual pass holder system has now turned into the new Magic Key system. Disneyland's new Magic Key program offers several different tiers, including the Dream Key, the Believe Key, the Enchant Key, and the Imagine Key. We talked to Nick Elariga, who is a YouTuber and a Disney blogger and runs a page called Wonders of Magic and got his thoughts on the new Magic Key program. It is very difficult, hard to access. Um, it's for the diehard Disney fan who wants to check reservations all the time. Uh, it's not for the family who wants to come on the weekends. Disneyland's new Magic Key program starts at $3.99, but the most expensive key, the Dream Key, starts at $13.99. And even with the most expensive pass that you can buy, people are still left without reservations and not being able to access the parks when they would like to. A lot of people do work and the weekends are just so booked uh, for the Magic Key. It's pretty nearly impossible to get in here on the weekend. Even with the highest tier key, the Dream Key, which is supposed to have no blockout dates, we can see that reservations are unavailable for most weekends and holidays. Uh, reservations are not easy to obtain and uh, hopefully they become easier uh, in the future, but as of now, it's pretty a pain in the butt. As of right now, Disneyland has not stated whether reservations will become more widely available, but as the holidays arrive, we might see reservations become even more harder to obtain. This is Timothy Foster for CSUF News. Back to you, Alexis. Thank you, Timothy, for joining us. It seems entertainment has changed a lot since going back in person. Now for our last story of the day, we have reporter Justin Lynch talking about how competitive play fighting games have also changed. Fighting games prior to the COVID-19 pandemic were primarily played in offline venues like the previous esports arena behind me. However, as mandates were induced, fighting game players were forced to move from the offline venues they love to play online in their homes. It doesn't hit the same as when it's 3 a.m., you're tired with your boys, you've been running bracket for seven hours, but y'all have been like kicking it and waiting and rooting on and feeling the crowd and the energy and laughing and, and having a good time and actually making memories. One of the largest tournaments affected has been the Evolution Championship Series, also known as EVO. The tournament used to be what could be considered the Super Bowl of fighting game tournaments. This year, it was made to be online. The top two players from the online tournaments were to be flown out to Las Vegas to compete in a tournament with $25,000 on the line. However, with the Delta variant running rampant, the online event had to be canceled. Jonathan Tenney got third place at one of these online tournaments. 
the losers finals, it was like that's some of the fastest I've ever lost a match in a fighting game. That was fine, but um, winner finals, I was actually just really upset. So it brought me more. It made me more upset than it made me happy, honestly. Technical issues while playing online have made some players believe that online tournaments are completely illegitimate. Fighting games online are not even remotely the same as offline. Despite vaccines being rolled out to more people, offline competitive play of fighting games is still in a flux. Justin Lynch, signing off with CSUF News. Thank you, Justin, and that concludes our show for today. Thank you for watching. I'm Dylan Ferris. I'm Alexis Garcia, and this is CSUF News.